Hi, everyone, and welcome to Technologies for Liberation, Moving Toward Abolitionist Futures. This is the final session in NFG's 40 Years Strong Virtual Convening Series. I'm Courtney Benayad, she, her pronouns, and I'm NFG's Director of Membership and Communications. We'll be getting started shortly with an introduction from our board member and convening co-chair, Shona. Um, and in the meantime, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat by adding your name, pronouns, organization, and location. We do have live captioning available today that you can turn on in your Zoom toolbar. You can also join us on video by turning on your camera, but please do keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. This session is being recorded and will be available to rewatch or share on NFG's website. And now I'm going to pass it off to you, Shona. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Shona Chakravarti. I'm with the Hill Snowden Foundation. I live in New York City, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am a proud NFG board member and uh, was the co-chair of our convening that was uh, supposed to happen uh, uh, this summer in Washington, DC. Um, we are celebrating NFG's uh, 40th anniversary and had planned a fabulous three-day extravaganza in DC before uh, the pandemic uh, you know, brought that to an end and forced us to change our plans. And um, I think we've done actually a pretty amazing job of um, shifting um, a lot of our sessions. We, we held our plenaries um, virtually um, and they were uh, very well attended. Um, and what we decided to do with some of um, the workshops that we had uh, selected was to present a series of, of webinars. And so today's is actually um, the last in that, in that series that started in September. And um, you know, reflect uh, the, the, the themes of the conference, um, uh, 40 years strong people um, uh, and place. And we um, are really excited about, I'm really excited about today's um, session because it's um, a topic that I actually don't know very much about. So I'm, I'm eager uh, to, to learn more about how um, uh, movement groups are responding um, to uh, the increased um, surveillance um, technology be being used for, for surveillance um, to um, increase criminalization of vulnerable communities um, and how this um, connects to um, the, abolition the abolitionist um, uh, framework and, and movement. Um, so I, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to thank the staff of NFG, staff and consultants of NFG, um, who worked so hard on the conference and we were just so excited to hold the conference in June, but have done an amazing job of, of pivoting um, and presenting um, uh, all these sessions um, in a virtual format. Um, so um, I, I think um, it's been a really good experience and um, I hope we can continue uh, doing some form of this in, in the future. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to today's um, moderator who is Brenda Salas Neves, who is Senior Program Officer at the Estrella Lesbian Foundation for Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shona, and good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm a senior program officer at the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice. I use they and she pronouns. Um, and I'm also very excited to be here today. I'm especially really excited to be able to share space with such an amazing group of people. And we are so grateful that NFG is hosting us as part of their final session of this amazing uh, season of conversations among, among all of us as funders. Um, the conversation today is part of the launch of our newest report, Technologies for Liberation. Many of you might have received the link uh, to the website and the PDF uh, from the NFG conference organizers. So we invite you to go uh, and check it out online and um, um, review and read the report. Um, at Astrea, we support queer, trans, two-spirit, Black, Indigenous, and people of color organizers that are working at the intersections of gender justice, 
racial justice uh, and migrant justice uh, and economic justice and whose communities are often targets of surveillance and criminalization. So really the report and also this uh, conversation today um, is part of the result of like very close conversations with movement organizers, uh, researchers, policy advocates, media makers, healing practitioners, movement technologies who are deeply rooted in abolition work. And um, these folks are also often under-resourced, like these organizations are often under-resourced and they're still continuing to fight to end policing and the use of carceral technologies. Um, and we're really inspired by the work that they're doing, how they're transforming and reimagining futures that are outside of carceral logics and outside of politics of punishment and outside of surveillance narratives. So as funders, we really believe that it's our role to follow their lead. And as you will hear in the panel today, uh, technology has been used and continues to be used as a tool to amplify systems of oppression and violence, specifically against communities of color in the US. And we have seen over and over again how movement organizers are courageously reshaping this narrative around what it means to keep communities safe and who gets to define what safety looks like. And they're doing it with such incredible resilience and brilliance. And this is something that we're really learning here at Estrella. And we really believe this is an opportunity for us or funders to show up. We believe that abolition is the antithesis of surveillance culture as that's something that movement organizers continue to tell us all over and again. So we really wanna honor this idea that abolition is both a vision and a political strategy. And so abolition is organizing needs to be resourced and it's our responsibility of, as funders to do it. So this conversation today, similarly to the report is an offering to engage uh, all of us more deeply with organizers who are really pushing us to think more radically. If anything, this year has shown us that we must radically reimagine our present and also our futures. And that's why we really need to radically reimagine our funding strategies and our funding approaches. So we hope that today is the beginning or the continuation to collectively strategizing. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask our really amazing panelists to introduce themselves, where they're coming from regionally uh, and politically before we get started with our conversation today. Um, so I'll pass it on to Jacinta. Hey, good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be able to, to be here with you today. Um, my name is Jacinta Gonzalez, and I'm a senior campaign organizer with Mi Gente. Um, and Mi Gente is a, a national membership organization of Latina and Chicane folks that are organizing around racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, um, climate justice, since we know that these are all of the issues that, that impact all of us. Um, I'm usually based in Phoenix, Arizona, but I'm calling in from Mexico this morning, so very, very excited to be here with everybody. Um, and I'm gonna uh, thank you so much, Jacinta. And um, Ash, if you wanna introduce yourself, please. Greetings, everyone. I'm Ash Helm Hernandez. I'm project director of Tiger's Eye Collective, a queer security, culture, and educational project uh, that was born out of uh, the Pulse incident in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we believe that we keep our people safe uh, and we believe that we're best equipped to do so. Uh, and we're a crew of black trans and queer leaders. Uh, and basically we really want to be able to show uh, and highlight that legacy of we're the ones, we're the ones we've been waiting for. In my paid work, I'm the national program manager for GSA Network. Uh, and I'm just honored to be here. Thank you, Brenda. Good to see everyone. Thank you so much, Ash. Um, and and. Hamid, if you want to introduce yourself too, please. Sure. Good morning, everybody, and greetings from uh, Long Beach, uh, California. My name is uh, Hamid Khan. I go by he, him. I am uh, one of the co-founders and campaign coordinator of uh, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Uh, we're based out of uh, Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. Been around for the, this organization has been around for about 11 years. Um, and one of the, 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 the fundamental reasons that the coalition came about was uh, that increasingly we were seeing that how occupation style tactical tactics uh, and programs were being, which are being used in, overseas in the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan and various other places 
were being, uh, uh, in a very rapid way, were being incorporated into domestic policing, including surveillance and other uh, military-style tactics, which are rooted in occupation. So that's what brought the coalition up. And, uh, and we've been doing a lot of organizing, building knowledge, decolonizing a lot of knowledge, and building power in the community, and have had some successes in dismantling some of the programs locally here. Looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hamid. Um, so for folks, just to let you know that we're gonna start first with a, um, a little bit of a context setting, and then we'll jump into talking a little bit about the strategies that folks are using and also addressing um, the needs, no? And then providing some ideas for us as funders of how, how do we step up, no? And how do we actually support these amazing folks? So um, let's begin uh, with Hamid, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll be coming back to folks. If, let's talk about the issues, no? where are we now and what is going on? So Hamid, if you can share a little bit about um, how is policing and surveillance from the government impacting communities of color, and what are the threats of the so-called surveillance culture and surveillance narratives? Sure. Uh so in order to uh, better understand uh, that where we are at this uh, uh, today with surveillance and policing, it's extremely instructive for us to have a, an understanding of history as well. Uh, one of the, 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 the founding guidelines of the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition is that uh, what, we are, what we are seeing today, what we are going through is not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. Uh, which really helps us in debunking a lot of existing narratives and how we look at surveillance and how we experience surveillance. Um, by which I mean that the, the conventional understanding is that surveillance is, is an invasion of privacy. Well, it definitely is. Uh, but I think what it does is it narrows the scope, uh, which then informs our fight as well, because in order to fight back, we have to really know our fight. And typically the historic responses to that have also been rooted in looking at it through a very narrow sort of constitutional rights lens that, okay, well, which, which rights have been violated, which then turn into a, a fight back of looking for cases and then filing cases or looking for legislative fixes. But when we start mapping out surveillance, and this is what the coalition has been doing uh, as a key tool to, to build knowledge and, and education in our communities, uh, we go back to, for example, lantern laws, which of course other uh, Professor Simone Brown and other folks have also talked about, uh, laws back in New York City, back in the early 1700s, where if you were an enslaved body, uh, indigenous person or a person of African descent, um, you had to walk with a lantern in your hand to self-identify yourself as a threat to the system. Uh, so through that whole process, when you look back over 300 years, uh, we look at the lantern laws and you look at, you know, just to, in, in that timeline, look at the black codes immediately in the aftermath of uh, emancipation, that how black codes were used to reincarcerate uh, for slave labor, which we still see as a result of the, the mass incarceration. And then we look at the red squads, the red squads from the 1880s. Uh, which were one of the first uh, covert sections within local law enforcement agencies, which preceded uh, the FBI by about 50 years. And that's the Red Squads being as a result of the Haymarket strike, which led to the creation of uh, International Workers Solidarity Day, or known as May Day, uh, in which Chicago Police Department started these uh, Red Squads, which then proliferated all across the country into Philadelphia and New York, Los Angeles, and other places as well. And then, of course, we see Jim Crow, we see COINTELPRO, um, uh, the counterintelligence programs of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and then moving into the post 9-11 arena. So I think what helps us understand is that who has been on the receiving end uh, of these practices and, and, and who has been impacted the most. And I think that's where we arrive at a, at a better understanding that no, this is more than the invasion of privacy. This is the intent to cause harm the intent to cause harm that how race and poverty and suspect bodies need to be policed, how race and poverty and suspect bodies in which I would include uh, queer trans folks, uh, poor folks and various other community members, that how they need to be contained, how they need to be controlled, how they need to be policed, and, and what are the operations that you constantly, which then we see, you know, the, the history of redlining, we see again the, the continuation of, of policing of segregation as well, and weaponizing segregation in ways, but that but surveillance was a key element, um, you know, just the sundown laws, you know, just that's a form of surveillance. So now we do speak about technology, and I think what we have seen is 
that that post 9/11, and that's what brought the coalition uh, up as well. That you know, with the expansion of surveillance, that how information sharing is the primary vehicle of control. That how even thought has been commodified. Uh, and how it's been commodified and 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 monetized as well because there's there's a lot of money to be made. So I'm sort of trying to create this big picture sort of sense uh, for myself and 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 uh, folks as well that it's it's way much bigger and for us to understand. And here maybe one example I can share is and uh, uh, Shelley, if I can get that slide one up. Um, that we've been mapping uh, the infrastructures and architectures, but this is something that we've been walk, uh, working on, that how information moves within various sectors, within the public sector, within the private sector, within social media, within law enforcement agencies, internationally as well, that how information moves, how it, 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 it then instructs and guides the border crossings, how it instructs and guides uh, movement of people across the world, and especially now in these days of, as we are into mass of ecological disasters and mass global migration, how this, this, will, this, this will impact the, uh, people around the world. So in a sense, on a local level, that how our bodies are being constantly traced and tracked and monitored and literally being stalked to be contained and controlled. Uh, a small example I can share out of this would be, and, and Shelly, if I can get slide two, that, that we just released a report on the Department of Children and Family Services, which is a public sector department in, in the county of Los Angeles, which really provides uh, serve benefits to, to and child protective services. But when you unpack the information sharing uh, just within the, the Department of Children and Family Services, you see the scale of, of how vast uh, and the scope of this information sharing environment is and how it is it, it, it really just is, is a matter of, of way, how our bodies are being policed which helps us then, then to better understand that, okay, then what is our defense? That it's not just about like, you know, listening into our phones or tracking our social media or tracking when we are driving down the uh, road that the license plate readers are when we're on the phone, stingrays and some of these, this equipment has been deployed. And then, and, and lastly, I would say that the rise that has given to, to the surveillance industrial complex, you know, where you have companies like Palantir and various other corporations that have come in and, and, and monetize this massive information sharing environment in the stock estate. So I think I'm gonna stop here um, and pass it back to Brenda in the interest of time, but there's a whole lot to be said, but uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Hamid. I feel SOPLAPD Spying Coalition has been doing such important work for years, and you all have been also like mentors to us, knowing how do we think about this report and how do we actually share this information. So thank you for sharing that. And that's also, um, that also, that was also a good segue to ask Jacinta specifically around this surveillance industrial complex that you mentioned, Hamid, um, and also thinking a lot, how is it specifically impacting migrant communities like Jacinta, how is the collaboration between private corporations and the government? How are they collaborating and using technologies um, against migrant communities here in the US? Yeah, um, well, first, thank you, Hamid, for, for that background and that history, because I do feel like it kind of sets us up to really be talking about both the history of surveillance, but how much things changed after 9-11 and how much that was really a catalyst for so much of the technologies that we're seeing now at the hands of police. Um, you know, I think for a lot of us, I, I personally, you know, have been organizing with a lot of folks at Mi Gente before we were Mi Gente, right? When we were part of the Not One More Deportation campaign, where we've been fighting against ICE and different policing agencies for, for a very long time. And so that kind of lets us kind of be able to track in different moments and different chapters, how this problem is kind of constantly changing to adapt itself to, to, to the modern day. So, you know, I think when 9-11 when happened and DHS was formed, this whole rhetoric of being able to defend the homeland was really used as kind of this, this um, messaging of that it's going to be okay to protect the homeland and, and at all costs, right? And within that, there's the creation of ICE as an individual police force that is at the disposal of the president that is being used to surveil, detain, and deport migrants in this country. And so, you know, at, when that happened, they started to realize that they had a huge logistical problem at their hands, right? DHS and ICE was created with the sole purpose of trying to deport everyone who was undocumented in this country. 
And so what that meant was they had a few agents and they had millions of people. And so from the beginning, they were really thinking about how to amplify their force and how to have further reach, right? So the first way they started to do that, ICE, was starting to work with collaboration with local police forces, right? So they might have 287G agreements with a local police or a local sheriff. They might have secure communities inside of the jail so that they can share fingerprint information and be able to place detainers on people and transfer people from inside of jails. But with that, as they were starting to expand that and have more relationships with local police officers and also start to access different networks of information, who started to build that up was actually tech companies. And many of those tech companies are also military companies, right? These are companies that have actually been creating things for the army, for, for um, international war zones for a very long time, brought those same services to a militarized border, and then start to go into the interior by building up these local contracts. But what we started to realize more and more, especially with the Trump administration, is that people started to call us and be like, ICE came to raid my home, but I have no idea how they have my address or they showed up and they knew that so-and-so was my cousin. Like, how do they get this level of information, especially if I've never gotten a traffic ticket or never had contact with a local police officer? And so that really made us, forced us to start to do some research. And we, we partnered with a corporate research firm to do a huge mapping of all of the corporations that have contracts, you know, whether it's tech, data, surveillance, um, with ICE for the purpose of, you know, deporting immigrants. And what we found was really, really horrifying, right? We started to realize that it wasn't just data that's coming from police. There's private data brokers like Thomson Reuters or RELX that many lawyers might think are like just research tools. Turns out they're data brokers and are literally selling like utility information from people to ICE to be able to create target lists to be able to go after people when they do raids. You have companies like Clearview that are inventing facial recognition technology that uses pictures scraped from the internet to go after people. Um, you start to have companies, you know, as you start to create more and more data, you need data analytics companies that are gonna process all of that information. Companies like Palantir. Then where are you gonna store all of this information? Turns out Amazon got you, right? They have huge contracts to be able to hold all of this information for, for police forces. So when, when, when we realized all of this and put out this report called Who's Behind ICE, the tech and data companies fueling deportations, we realized that there was really, we had to start to campaign not only against DHS and ICE, but also against these corporations that were really kind of creating the machinery for this huge surveillance network that was existing. And so for us, it was a huge challenge as movement because we both have to be thinking about how we do policy interventions, right? How do we fight back against policing agencies? How do we have those visions? But also how do we bring corporations to account when they're the ones that are facilitating all of this and when they're creating technologies that are outpacing any sort of human rights protections that we can have. So that's when we decided to launch the No Tech for ICE campaign. Um, we'll get a chance to, to talk a little bit about it um, later, but for us, it was precisely this need to expose these companies so that also frontline folks, folks that are fighting ICE on a day to day, know how to protect themselves or at least know where their data is going. Um, but then also give people corporate targets that we can be hitting to be exposing what's coming. And I think that, you know, this conversation is particularly going to be important under this new administration, right? Because the Biden administration is very comfortable with other conversations. But as soon as it comes to surveillance and technology, they're the first proponents of it, right? And many times they're saying that it's a safer alternative, that it's a less harmful alternative, that it's better. But really what it means is just more corporations that are kind of lining their pockets with this new opportunity. So it kind of makes us have to be extra vigilant on both of those fronts. Um, so yeah, so I think that's a little bit just kind of like the mapping out of all of this. I'll put right now in the chat, but if folks go to notechforice.com, you can see a bunch of our reports, mapping of all the corporations, videos, like all of the information, if you wanna go down the rabbit hole of all of these tech companies. Yes, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jacinta, no? And I think that's also, um, it is also something like, as you were saying, no? how to think about how like surveillance and policing has, as you mentioned also, how may have been justified, no? That, and then this like conflation or like these notions of like safety and security, especially as it comes from a very like militarized perspective as well, no? And how that is really impacting communities. Um, and also, so Ash also asking you how, like you were rooted in the South, and then um, 
if you can share like how do the increased levels of surveillance and policing are impacting black communities in the south Thank you, Brenda, for that important question. And I just want to thank my panelists, uh, Hamid and Hasintha. Hamid, thank you so much for the historical context that's greatly needed to this conversation, especially when we think about, I would say in our most recent memory of the last hundred years or so, uh, as black folks are up from slavery. Uh, so I'm blessed to be in my ancestral land of Louisville, Kentucky. So I'll, I'll aim from that perspective uh, as long and along with uh, the last decade when I spent in Atlanta. Uh, what we're seeing is a continuation, as Hamid said, that that the slave patrols turning into police, right? And so even at the turn of the century, you have where Black folks, and particularly I'll, I'll speak to, had nowhere to go uh, as slavery ended. And so we're still at this point where in the communities in which we live are being over-policed because uh, of our bodies, right? And so simultaneously as we have we, we've been oppressed uh we know that we are commodity that we we know that that, that there's a great importance and value in us uh we have our own affirmations in that way but but that um the powers that be uh want to always keep a control over us a population control and so you'll you'll continue to see where uh black communities uh, are being over policed in ways in which that we, res we have responded to that as a black community with that conversation, what we call the talk, that black men and black women and trans and non-binary folks, we have to be aware of police in all interactions, that at any moment we may lose our lives for any reason. And so I know that um, my ancestors faced a grave danger that, uh, that we too face in different ways. Uh, however, we see that manifest differently through technology and in the ways in which uh, the pervasiveness of our lives, um, you know, that now we have that at a distance and somewhat insidiousness right at the palms of our hands and fingertips. Uh, and so, you know, this affects our, our everyday life when you think about the ways in which our communities are able to grow economically, um, that we have great value on our culture but simultaneously we're being stalked, as Hamid said. And so there, there are ways in which I see our community um, facing the dangers of having our bodies uh, over-policed in ways in which the police can have the technology to surveil us, but there's no way that police can have that set, use that same technology against themselves, right? And we see that, um, and I would relate this story to uh, the Burana Taylor case uh, where we uh, lost our beloved, this person was stopped, okay, by police and surveillance. Now, the lies that circum surround her death were police used a botched raid. So again, police are, are faced with saying, this person is a criminal and here are the, the, their uh, accomplices and all the people surrounding them. So it's something Hasinta some, mentioned around, we know who your people are. And so tracing, tracing this woman and saying you're connected. And so not only did we see this play out in the uprising and while, we, we, while the folks in Louisville uh, is, essentially came, this came to a head was because we knew this woman was in community. She was an essential worker. And so at this time of her death, not only do we not have body cam footage that you know the government is working against us. And so in this way, this information doesn't come out until they're what exonerated from some of these things and so in, in in some ways the community has been suffering we're in a great deal of pain and so that's what i'm seeing is that with police they're being used right so part of that story is about clearing out an area that that is undesirable so that they can sell the homes for pennies on the dollar and, and, and redevelopment. So these things go round and round about how our communities are undervalued, right? And how the over-policing of our bodies, uh, you know, <sighs> encapsulate what we're facing now and what we're calling gentrification and things like that. And so it, it really burns me up because black and queer and trans folks are in this fight for our lives as well. And we're on the front lines. We've been in every uh, movement. And so it today even, it's harder for us to see that technology is pervasive enough that 
the ways in which we even engage in it are against us. And that when we try to create community, there's often a breakdown because police are already able to surveil. And so I see this uh, play out in Atlanta when we were doing that no more, uh, not one more deportation campaign and where you know, we, we found it our duty as black and trans folks uh, to be buffers against the police of our undocumented brothers and sisters because again, you're a, a, a community is facing the over-policing. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why Tiger's Eye Collective even came about. Like I mentioned before, of course, um, the Orlando incident, but essentially we are the ones. Um, we are a continuation of a black freedom movement. We are a, a continuation of the black radical tradition. And so for us, we wanna uphold that promise that we will keep us safe and in turn, um, I think that our formations uh, oftentimes bring about, you know, that that pervasiveness that I see now that uh, movement leaders are facing being on quote unquote lists of FBI, where the FBI and uh, has and other agencies have labeled uh, the BLM movement as a terrorist group, and when we know that there that. Maybe BLM is an organization, but but Black Lives Matter is an affirmation that had resound in the world that in our in, in my generation that that is our affirmation, our call uh, to the front line, and so people will always go into the streets because we have always been under attack. We have always been under in a in a this oppressive uh, mode, and so it is this call to duty. It is it is a fact that we must um, respond. And so there are ways in which our communities are, are hampered by police. Um, you know, it's hard for me to be, uh, had spent the last decade in Atlanta where I see the local government, because uh, Atlanta's layered, uh, has black police. And so you, you have our own communities pit against each other in that way and people in our community while, while, while you also see the face of the Klan and you also see uh, uh, the greater, you know, sort of, state troopers, if you will, uh, be able to be this formation of, of, of white police uh, that lead in a different way. And so there's a deeper, deeper layers of uh, how the, the state is able to continue, you know, the genocide uh, of our people. And so, you know, I think this pits us in a corner, uh, but we're fighting. I know that this uprising is, is only a continuation of where we have come and where we will go and what we continue to see that the pandemic took away somewhat that veil and, and gave us time to actually respond in ways in which we probably wouldn't have in any other in t time setting. I'll leave it there for now, Brenda. Yeah, no, thank you, Ash, so much. And thank you for naming uh, there are two points that you mentioned around this notion of population control and just as a whole control um, and what, what the government and the state are inflicting on communities. But also thank you for naming about, we are living in a critical moment. Like 2020 is like a very critical year. And while a lot of these issues have been going on for a while, um, there's a lot of things that are happening right now, specifically how it relates around surveillance. Um, in, in this moment of 2020 in the context of COVID-19. Um, so bringing it back to you, Jacinta, if you can share about what you are seeing that is happening around the surveillance industry, how they are expanding as it relates to this, uh, this global pandemic that we are going through. You know, I think to, to kind of, one, I think that we have to understand that what's happening with surveillance is obviously an expansion of control and all of the things that we've been discussing, but it's kind of happening at the same time that also surveillance capitalism is expanding. And so the commodification of all of our lives, right, in terms of how now our data is being bought and sold and is actually more profitable than oil, right, like as an industry globally. And so you have to kind of understand that the consequences of that go in multiple directions, right? In terms of our access to information and thought, right? As Hamid was talking about control of, of, of all of that. The way these huge corporations like Amazon, right? One of the wealthiest corporations in the history of humanity, all of this information, wealth controlled in just one, you know, very few hands. And so on top of that, when you have a situation like a global pandemic, all of those forces are kind of at play. 
And so you start to see issues with disinformation around the pandemic, right, and access to services and how that politically plays out. You start seeing issues around, you know, who has access to what but also how people, you know, their lives are more than anything digital now, right? Like how many of our meetings are now Zoom? How much of our digital footprint has expanded? But that also means that there's more interest from the state to be able to have access to that information, control it and manipulate it for a bunch of different reasons. And so one of the things that we've been watching and been very concerned about has been how some of these big tech and surveillance companies have taken advantage of the pandemic and the threat of COVID to expand their government contracts, but also expand their access to information. So, you know, before when I was talking about the kind of the, the, the line that, that um, ICE has created where they'll have data brokers and then folks that do data analytics and then cloud services that host that, you know, the data analytics part has been really important because you can have all of the data sources that you want, but if you don't have someone who's able to process it and kind of package it nicely to hand it over to the police officers, because let's be really honest, they're not that, um, they're not great investigators. So you really got to put it on it, like kind of set it out for them, spell it out for them, give them the file, give them the address. Um, that data analytics has been a huge, huge industry that has grown. And some of the most unscrupulous companies have been the ones that go into it. So one company that really basically tailor made the data analytics system for ICE is this company Palantir. And you know, Palantir, Hamid talked about them. They've been having contracts with the military for a very long time. They've had contracts with police departments for a very long time. You know, we've been really invested in some of the worst technologies, but they've also been really pitching an interesting economic model where they were a private company for 17 years. They just launched their um, public listing uh, a couple months ago. And they're trying to say that this is profitable but what they're actually showing us is that the only way that they can make a profit is if they have government contracts. So it's actually not that there's a market, but they're actually going in and intentionally lobbying in the government to get access to all of this. So not only do they have a contract with ICE, Palantir has a contract with the RRS and Palantir also has a contract with HHS, right? Health and Human Services to actually create a platform called Protect to monitor data um, on COVID. Yesterday it came out, they now have a new contract with the FDA. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with one company having access to all of our information, including contracts with policing agencies? A lot could go wrong, right? Like there's just so much at risk and so much at stake with this. And so what we started to see is that COVID has become an excuse to be able to surveil people more, but also that government agencies are allowing these companies to do backdoor deals to figure out these contracts without us having any information around where is our data going? How is it being used? And do we have any protections for this? So what we've seen is not only like an expansion of what data they have access to, but also within government, kind of a, a, a deeper rooting of this idea that, well, the government can't do this. We need a private corporation to come in and create these systems for us. And that is also creating this kind of really strong connection between these companies understanding that their way of making money is off of us through our tax dollars. And so we just kind of see this cycle that is coming up more and more that is really, really dangerous. And I think that's why we've been focusing so more on targeting Palantir, because we think that it's just a kind of, it's a, a good organizer once told me that every party needs a piñata. You kind of need somebody that you can go and beat up on and really kind of make them the example of what's going on. And in so many ways, Palantir is really that piñata because of all of the contracts that they have with surveillance and policing. Um, and how they're connecting it to the military industrial complex. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Um, and also, Hamid, in addition to what Jacinta has shared, and especially given the work that you all are doing um, and such a, like, a clear understanding no, around like the physical and the digital threats, like what, are, what should we keep in mind in these moments? Like what are all additional threats that we need to be paying attention to in this moment of COVID-19? Well, in this moment, uh, again, going back to, uh, as I had said, that uh, looking at it through a historic lens as well, we've seen that any time when these uh, uh, both supposed crises or pandemics or, or, or uh, uh, happen, that how the national security police state expands itself 
how it develops new programs, how it builds on existing programs to contain and control, how it accumulates new weapons, um, and, and what is the tactical strategy. So I think it's really uh, in, critical to understand and, 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 and follow that and map it out. Uh, uh, Ash had mentioned Breonna Taylor's. I think one of the key things around digital um, uh, policing and, and uh, some of these programs around uh, data analytics, around this language of artificial intelligence, machine learning, risk assessment tools, predictive analytics, algorithms, is uh, give you a small example of our fight around predictive policing. Uh, which we successfully dismantled and organized, uh, uh, you know, community power to demand, and the LAPD had was forced into dismantling that program. But in that process, what we learned was uh, that how communities were being very, very methodically targeted uh, through this language of predictive policing, how full neighborhoods in South Central Los Angeles and predominantly communities which are black and brown and poor were being quarantined as these hot zones and laser zones and, and hot spots were being created. So, so when you start mapping a lot of this information, a story emerges. A story emerges that it's not just about, uh, about this whole pseudoscience of predicting crime, because now we know that as in the, the history of intelligence-led policing, that behavioral surveillance and data mining and data harvesting, as Cynthia was talking about too, is the primary focus and is, is the primary way that how policing happens. But then what happens with that as well? So it's not just about predicting crime, it's about quarantining, it's about redlining, it's about the almost like a digital Jim Crow uh, that we can see being unleashed uh, all around our communities. So in a sense, the, the, the area that Brianna Taylor was living in, that is what we would call location-based policing. That's what we would call this, this whole partnership between land speculators, this partnership between real estate developers. The, the, the city. So in LA, for example, we have been uncovering uh, communications between land developers, real estate speculators, neighborhood prosecutors, the city attorney's office, law enforcement agencies, that how, in, in a sense, banishment and removal of people is being is being is being done under the guise of this machine learning and pseudoscience of predictive policing. That this area is a hot spot. This is where uh, crime triggers are. So in a sense, whole malls have been have been deemed as these threat areas as well. And the language of laser zones and anchor points and hot spots is being used to really mask a lot of this harm that is happening. So I think in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, similarly, what is happening is that COVID-19 has become a tremendous opportunity to expand the stalker state as well. And of course, Palantir is central to this thing. But then again, the whole infrastructure is being set up and that how this information will continue to provide more uh, power and more, more, more knowledge and more, you know, just information about communities to be traced and tracked and monitored. So in a sense, the, 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 what it comes back to is that what is our defense and how do we fight back? And I think, well, I guess we will talk more about that organizing during this time of COVID as well. But I think it's also an opportunity for us to, to kind of just do a deep dive into these structures of violence as well. That, you know, most of the time, and, and the coalition released a report two years ago, and the title of the report is Before the Bullet Hits the Body. And what it talked about dismantling predictive policing in Los Angeles, and I'll, and I'll post that, the link to that report, that what, what it maps out is that what are the conditions on the ground ultimately when the gun comes out and the trigger is pulled? That what leads to that point of contact that, that, that escalates this concentration. Is it social network analysis? Absolutely it is. It is like, you know, deeming areas as threat areas? Absolutely it is. It is like, is it like turning youth organizing into a national security issue by, by using the language of extremism um, and, and radicalization? Absolutely it is. So I think we have to really kind of just look at it in a comprehensive way to better understand, which will that then inform our fight as well. Yes, thank you, Hamid. And um, transitioning into um, this piece around like thinking about what are the strategies that y'all are doing, no? like the, the really amazing work that y'all are doing, how you're responding back. Um, Ash, specifically to you, as, uh, especially uh, Tiger's Eyes Collective is doing such like meaningful work around thinking around security from a perspective of community specifically. Um, if you can share more how you all are providing support to other movement and communities, especially the work that you'll be doing since the 
uh, during the uprisings in support of Black Lives over the last few months. Um, and how are you, yeah, what, how is the work going around this big vision that you mentioned around for like Black liberation? Thanks, Brenda, for that. Um, I feel like this is such a, a meaty question as well, you know, because um, right now with our organization, with our formation, you know, we've been trying to support uh, community leaders on the ground, uh, especially in light of uh, our, my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, engaged in this uprising and having being the center uh, of, of so much attention on the case of Breonna Taylor. Um, and so for us, I think that it's for us to use our networks and, and, and connect, and that's what we've been doing um, and trying to partner with uh, organizations uh, where those connections make sense. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about providing a response, it's been a hard moment, you know, as, as, we, as we navigate that thin line that COVID has had an effect on us, where you have uh, the uprising where people have poured into the streets. And then where you have, there are an insurmountable amount of people who have been supporting who are not in the streets. And so there, there's oftentimes um, this, this sort of uh, push and pull, right? because there are people who are able to put their bodies on the line directly. And so, you know, there are other folks who are able to be in, in boardrooms and classrooms, virtual classrooms, if you will, and be able to support in ways in which we will never know and never see. And so, you know, it's been our role to partner with these, uh, to see one, because this has been a virtual, virtual excuse me, a vulture moment where, where people see uh, an opportunity, right? And so it's not just about black liberation in that time, you know, and 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 the the over policing and, and the surveillance of us uh, gathering, right? Where are we? And I I seen where Google Maps shifted and had a zone of where the uprising was, so that when you looked at Google Maps, you could see that. And so this was one of the things that our crew talked about is that how are we interfacing with, with folks and even where we live and, and getting to where we would want to be. And, and so uh, in our community and deciding to uh, uprise, I mean, I think that was a natural response um, to riot is that we seen that downtown was boarded up for quite some time, but it was boarded up also during a period of time where there was not, absolutely nothing happening, right? But the giving the more of a, the illusion, the threat that, that folks have that, that, they, that they wanted to, to tell uh, people against uh, the uprising, right? People who didn't feel like there was a need to do those things, uh, that there was trouble and that it was a certain kind of people who were bringing that trouble to a particular area of town. Um, and for us, we've seen where um, we had the military come in, we had the National Guard come in. And even in that, in that moment, the National Guard moved and went to the black community where there was no uprising happen and, and suddenly a man was killed and then they didn't know how. You have so much surveillance going on and then you, and you tell us you don't know how this man got shot and killed, right? And so for us, we see that as an opening for our group to start these discussions and conversations and so that we can find our people because uh, as you know, we are everywhere but that doesn't mean that we are all for one another. We do, we do know that COINTELPRO is, is alive and well, and we do know that there's an opposition working against us and that operatives are around and, 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 and launching down into our communities for whatever reasons we know to derail that black radical tradition, the black freedom movement, um, because they don't want us free to make decisions for ourselves. They don't want us to have that outcry about uh, police and, and, and lowering budgets. Uh, Last summer we were under attack. They closed public city pools. Where do you think young black children are being able to congregate? We could, they couldn't. And, and you have a ballooned police budget. And so you see the overcriminalization of young people in their own communities with no place to work, no place to have uh, entertainment outside of school and, and enjoy them, themselves. And so again, we're pitted against each other in that way. And so in, in this moment for us, we are trying to decide who 
because there's been a, a lot of emergence of different folks responding, especially with mutual aid. And that's where we found some of our best uh, sort of connections is with organizations who were providing mutual aid to people. We wanted to listen to folks to see where people were providing support to, to, to folks who, who could not, for whatever reasons in, in this moment of the COVID crisis, um, could not uh, do the same things they were doing pre-COVID. And so for us, it's our role as trans and non-binary and queer folks to, to build together, to strengthen our network and to utilize this moment to, to double down and to deepen our commitment on collective care and collective safety. When we see no safety net, when we see that the government is not responding, when we see that our local government is not responding, when we have a mayor who is incapable of, of making any real decisions, who, who in fact showed us Again, and I and I and I keep re referencing this Brianna Taylor case because uh, the family was awarded a, a large sum of money, and but then there's no responsibility for her death from the people who who murdered her, you know. But the city is saying there was a wrong, and what was the wrong? This woman was murdered. But still, you know, it's a slap in the face to us for them to have such a large budget when we still see young people uh, impoverished, when we still see a disproportionate uh, of queer and trans young people being rerouted from public schools to uh, other schools or, or juvenile detention centers where, where uh, the COVID crisis is stark, where you have folks uh, uh, needlessly put into jail for, for, for reasons of uh, exercise and their First Amendment rights. And so it is in this moment that we found ourselves uh, not at a crux or a crossroads, but it has given such a stark clearing that we we see who are, is not for us, and we and we we are seeing who is against us because it's the very people who aren't trying to help. And so there is a multitude of ways in which we help as community. Uh, we can't all be on the front line. Uh, we can't all be in the streets. And so we see a myriad of ways these things are happening uh, in our com in, in the community here in Louisville, uh, and with initiatives that have sprang up. Uh, that have deepened a promise to uh, provide that support to communities. And so, you know, for us, it's weeding out the confusion and it's bringing a level of seriousness to this moment, especially for Black, queer, and trans folks, that one, we are here, we are, we are the ones to survive this moment because we have each other's backs, because we have always been pitted against each other, that this, this moment of going through the fire this is a real moment of going through the fire for us. And I feel like that Tiger's Eye is trying to cling to bringing a cadre of folks who, who aren't just unafraid, but who are doing it and working through the fear. And so um, this, is, this is a time that we feel like that, you know, it spotlights uh, organization, you know, our small little or organization that's actually naming security and safety. Uh, and we know that other organizations for whatever reasons can't name it, but are truly doing the work that are truly intricate uh, to the fabric of our survival. And so we want to continue to support those, uh, those organizations with, like I said, collective care and education and especially arts and culture that are our survival uh, mechanisms and, and oftentimes have been the ways in which we, we communicate prior to having such advanced uh, technologies in place. And so, um, the response has been for us is to uplift those leaders, uh, to stand side by side, to be uh, folks that support their leadership and, and for us to make inroads in this community. And I'll leave it there. Yes, thank you, Ash. Um, and you raised such like key points no, around this notion of building the movement infrastructure as well. And, um, Bringing this back to you, Hamed, if you can share also, you've shared a little bit, if you can share more about the infrastructures that you all are building at Stop LAPD Spying Coalition around safety, like the connections around healing justice and digital organizing and how you all are defending from the ongoing surveillance from the government. So thank you. Uh, and of course, uh, as things go, we had to, as organizers, we had to adjust uh, the, the, the current moment as to how do we keep on uh, doing this knowledge exchange? How do we keep on building this collective power? Uh, what is our process of, of continuing reaching out to the community? Because in, um, in full disclosure, we really just don't work uh, to, uh, towards reforming the system. I mean, that's not our primary goal. It's about building knowledge and building power on the ground because 
the, the system is so vast and 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 messed up that it's very it, that it can't be reformed. It's just sort of you know a self. Uh, fulfilling prophecy. It's a self-sustaining uh, uh, system, just as, as a part of the broader uh, capitalist white supremacist state. Uh, so uh, I, what we have been doing is that uh, since 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 COVID hit, and as uh, you know, things were becoming more and more uh, critical starting March 3rd, because we would have a meeting every Tuesday in person in Skid Row, where where folks would come together and map out strategies and 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 organize and do uh, knowledge exchange. So we went into digital organizing and we've been holding a webinar every Tuesday since uh, March 24th. And today uh, we have our webinar part 38. Uh, so each one of these webinars is committed. Uh, so the first Tuesday webinar is looking at the intersection of the police state, the surveillance state and gender and sexuality. Uh, we, and, but also not just on a local level, but also on a global level. We've been able to, through this, how do we then uh, you know, build up on the tools that we have. So we've, we've been speaking to folks around surveillance and the police state as, as for you know, places like Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in Europe, in, in, uh, in Colombia, uh, with, uh, with folks, with queer trans folks over there and how it's impacting uh, gender. What is the intersection of gender? And I talked about the, some of the reports as well that we've been publishing. We've been looking at it through the lens of the war on youth that is uh, that how nuanced surveillance and policing is. So just today at our six o'clock webinar, uh, Pacific time, and, and this is a shout out to invite people as well. We will have folks from UK, uh, from organization called CAGE, uh, which, which looks as that how young people and are, are being targeted, particularly starting off with the Muslim, uh, Arab and Middle Eastern and South Asian communities are being impacted, but how it just proliferates and how it expands into other communities as well. We will also have folks from the Palestinian youth movement that what is the global connection uh, uh, what is the Israeli connection? What is what are the various other connections uh, of on, on a global level of this information exchange? So, and then of course the data-driven policing uh, uh, piece, which is which is critical. That how it is expanding. That's the fourth Tuesday of the month, uh, and then the third Tuesday we have look at the political moment and have general conversations. We've had folks uh, like Dr. Professor Dor Dorothy Roberts, uh, Simone Brown, various other folks who've been doing this work, and especially in this time of COVID that what does it really mean when the pandemic is, is all around us? And, and basically, you know, we've been, we've been challenged uh, both to, uh, to save our lives on many different levels. The, the continuing 500 year pandemic of white supremacy and settler colonialism and racism is a constant threat to, you know, particularly in, 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 in with our black, and, uh, uh, black community, indigenous community as well. So in a sense, I think that if what it uh, does is it, it creates opportunities to have a conversation that in this current moment, what is our defense? What is our defense where, you know, just do we just not even have to protect ourselves from the, the state violence and the pervasive monetization and the stocking of our bodies, but also, you know, the rise and this current wave. And I would say it's not just anything new at all of, of different faces of white supremacy as well, extreme violence, you know, faces of violence, uh, fascism and nationalism um, and various other groups that have, have, have been formed as well. So, so I think that there, there, there's a lot of mapping uh, that is going on. There is a lot of deep dive that is going on. There's a lot of uh, uh, community-based research that is going on as well, that is, which is then being brought out on the streets, which is then also helping build a stronger movement with the goal that it's not really about, uh, it's about building power and not paranoia. And, you know, just really knowing our fight that how do we pool in our resources or within that, what is the role of mutual aid? So in Skid Row, for example, we are part of the Los Angeles Community Action Network's family, the larger family, how we are then, then using this opportunity to make sure that community folks who are unhoused in the largest unhoused community in a dense 50 block radius anywhere in the United States, and what is the health and, and well-being means to them? So in a sense, what does healing justice look like? So we also have one of our projects is uh, the Our Data Bodies project, which the coalition was a part of was a partner in that project so how we have created um, various uh, uh, you know just just playbooks as well for people to learn uh, and better understand and map out information uh, that surrounds them as well so in a sense knowing our fight and then and then decolonizing that knowledge and bringing that knowledge together in building up our fights on many different levels 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Hamid. And a shout out to our Data Our Bodies uh, project that is really doing really amazing work. And also we have been, um, we can add the link later on in the chat here. I'm also looking at the time. So I'm gonna merge a little bit the questions that we have left. So we also have some time for Q&A from everyone. So folks, feel free to add your questions in the chat. We'll, ha we'll have a break before the Q&A and then we'll, um, ask those questions to the panelists. But um, bringing it back to you, Jacinta, um, if you also can share a little bit about the work that um, he, Mi Gente, how has Mi Gente been building relationships with other organizations and institutions across like movements and sectors uh, to do this, the work that you are doing and um, additionally, how that is also part of this larger vision for change that you all have and what opportunities you're seeing in this moment that we're in right now. Yeah, thank you for that for that question, Brenda. You know, I think we we definitely, the, the more we start to learn about surveillance and, and the way that tech companies are impacting everything, the more you start to feel like you're in a David and Goliath fight where you're just like, shit, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and you kind of start to feel smaller and smaller and smaller. And, Actually, one of the biggest things that has been really important and key to, to keeping up a fight is giving people both inspiration, but also lanes to fight in, right? Like sometimes we like get lost in all the analysis, we get lost in all the mapping of all the companies, all of the data, like it can actually feel really, really overwhelming. And so for us, it's been really important in this fight to really root it in the history and like know that we're just, this is just the next chapter. Right? like this is really the next chapter of policing and kind of understanding it from that because then you start to realize of all the moments in history where folks have felt so small there's always been a reason to fight and there's always been kind of really ways that people have been able to push back and so for us it's been important to kind of like keep that flowing through our through our veins to keep that energy going but we also realize that because it's such a huge problem we really have to be thinking about how we're building power in many multiple forms right and have multiplicity of strategies and multiplicity of, of partners and, and places where we're bringing this fight so for example because it's it's such an important thing for us to to keep this rooted in the fight against policing and in this fight towards abolition that you know last year we had a conference called take back tech and we intentionally, we partnered with Media Justice and Tech Workers Coalition to precisely bring people together from different sectors, folks that might be fighting for bail reform, right, and are dealing with algorithms, folks that are fighting against policing and are dealing with predictive policing, folks that are fighting against militarization, you know, veterans who are against the war, bringing all of those folks together to talk about how tech and data is kind of impacting it and what are the campaigns that you're involved in in, in fighting back. And so that was a really great space to be able to share analysis, share strategies, build relationships, build movement together, again, across sectors. Um, you know, I think another thing that we've really been focused on is like, how do we bring this information to folks who are directly confronting ICE on a day to day, right? And so we've, for example, created comic strips, right? A comic book just explaining data capitalism and how the police use surveillance and how ICE uses it and how we can organize. Um, but we also know that local fights can be really vibrant, but can be really hard, right? Exposing your local police department, fighting with your local city council. So we've also created different toolkits for people to be able to use in those fights. Um, but I think one of the things that to me has been really powerful has been seeing how precisely, mostly like women of color from different parts of the country have been fighting these big tech companies. And I think of like one time that we got a meeting with the CEO of, of Salesforce, right? Tony Profit who you know, invited us to come talk about Salesforce contract with CBP. And we showed up with, with a, a, you know, a group of five women from different areas around the border um, to sort of say like, we wanna to talk to you about this. And they wanted to make a sign an NDA right before going into the building. And we refused, we organized, we organized. And the thought that we were having this fight as he was wearing a feminist shirt on, and it was like all of these women being like, let me tell you actually about what's gonna be happening was just a really powerful moment that then let them go back to their communities to continue this fight around surveillance. So I also think like being able to have these moments of like direct confrontation between folks that are directly impacted and these corporations is really important, which is why we have to continue to like allow people pay spaces to organize, right? Sometimes that's your city, sometimes that's outside of a corporation, but it's always around like, how do we do the political education and getting people information to then giving them a, a lane to fight in. Um, but part of the, the, the collaboration has also been like, we started to see within the tech sector, 
tech workers themselves start to have a different consciousness about what they're doing. The thing is that organizing, you know, highly paid middle class like folks within tech companies turns out to be really difficult in a lot of ways that is kind of surprising. So both like figuring out how we build relationships with tech workers who are trying to do that within their companies, but also creating a, com a culture for future tech workers to understand resistance, particularly with students. So we've been partnering really closely with student groups on different campuses, groups like SLAP, the Students for the Liberation of All People on, at Stanford that have been fighting, right? Like Stanford is like such a place where so many of these technologies are being created and thought of to have students on campus fighting against recruitment by these companies, promising and making pledges to say that they're not gonna work for these corporations has been really transformative and has been really exciting to have new energy. And we start to see that the culture starts to change, right? Like five years ago, having a, 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 a fellowship or like a, some sort of thing with Palantir for students was like, ooh, I got an internship, it's great. Now they kind of understand that there's actually consequences where people start to understand that that's not a cool job anymore, right? You're actually contributing to policing. So figuring out how to start to change those power balances and also allowing students to fight on their campus because academia has been such a validator for a lot of these tech companies, right? Which kind of brings me to the, to the next kind of sector where we've been organizing, which has been within academia and researchers. Um, you know, when you think about predictive policing, when you think about facial recognition technology, data analytics, so many of these companies get these like academics to really kind of sign off on their things, right? Oh, well, we finished, we figured out this privacy form, or this is how the ethics get justified. But actually being able to have community-based research or research that is coming from movement organizations to counterattack that and have academic validators has been really, really empowered, right? And has been really powerful. So, you know, I shared the, the report, but, you know, having that report being taught in classes in universities has been incredibly, like, powerful in terms of when we're having conversations with these tech companies and need outside validators. Um, and another group that we've been working with really closely has been investors. It's kind of like a little bit of a, of a twist and a surprising one. We are under no delusions that, um, you know, investor strategies are going to be the way to win any of this. But we also understand that they do have a role to play and so have been partnering with groups like open mic or different unions in canada to do shareholder resolutions against some of these companies um, and have been doing different investor briefings and warnings um, using human rights analysis to show why these companies should not get investment and so for us it's been important to both be able to like create a comic strip that you know explains to someone like how ICE is trying to target you, create an investor briefing that tells someone like why you shouldn't put your money here, being able to create you know, channels for you know, the Berkeley Law Privacy Scholars Conference to drop Palantir as a sponsor, Lesbians Who Tech, drop Palantir as a sponsor, you know, Grace Hopper, drop Palantir as a sponsor. There's all of sorts of different options where people can kind of find their lane and, and fight in it. But I think to me, the, the most important thing is using this frame of take back tech to kind of have people also understand that we have a place to kind of come back to, um, to be having these conversations across movements and across sectors and across industries too, right? Like there's so many, you know, tech workers have their own way of kind of conceptualizing themselves. So I think there's also like just being able to be open and, and allow for that to happen. It's kind of allowing us to create enough movement to have a different conversation around tech. You know, I think in a lot of ways, it's like, so much of the tech stuff has, has moved faster than we've been able to respond, right? Um, but now we're here at this moment and the conversation is starting to shift. So I actually think that this is such a great moment for funders, for organizations, for other people to get involved because we're kind of on the brink of what, what's gonna be another couple of decades of, of fight on, on this terrain. Yeah, thank you, Jacinta. And, also, and this also brings us into this, the role that funders can play, no? like especially on, on this fight um, and the, on the work that y'all are doing. So, um, and then so for you both, uh, Ash and Hamid, whoever wants to jump in first, but it's also like, what opportunities do you see in the work that you're doing? And then what opportunities, especially, or what is the role of funders and what specifically philanthropy needs to know and needs to do to support this fight, no? That is like a long-term fight that in, like needs immediate response. So um, maybe Ash, if you wanna go first and then Hamid. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, I do feel like um, this role of funders, um, 
I can't say that I'm well versed in philanthropy, uh, but I do, I've had some interactions and I feel like that I've I learned a great deal from the Trans Justice Funding Project and how they uh, do their application and work with their grantee partners. And I'm very proud of the work uh, that they've done to streamline that process and, and along with uh, Borealis uh, as Tiger's Eyes funded through the Fund for uh, Transgenerations. And so um, for me in that limited scope, I feel like that funders oftentimes um, have cumbersome processes um, without having um, given the tools to organizations and, and formations rather that uh, need that support. And so I'm grateful that uh, our, uh, our crew has been able to have uh, coaches and, and support from our program officers and such to guide us through those things and, and give us a deeper understanding because oftentimes the encompassing work of even applying uh, puts us in a position uh, that takes away from our work. And so uh, we, we, we are the uh, expertise in our lived experience, but we may not be our expertise in, in philanthropy and the language uh, that philanthropy may need uh, for to do their work and, uh, and audits and such and things. And so, um, you know, it begs the, the question of what are you doing to help support uh, not just financially, I, we, we need the money, but not to encumber uh, uh, the, the process of, you know, there are some funders out here, and I may not be speaking to those that are on the line, so preaching to the choir, um, that put us in a bind, and that our work has to shift to, to, to bend to your will. And so in that way, they become gatekeepers. So, so how do you give funds and move out of the way? How do you not be so attached to that giving and questioning uh, the, the people who are doing the very work that you seek to fund? And then look for ways in which to go outside of that funding and to bend over backwards and to do what you must uh, to make sure that it gets into the hands of the people who, do, who not only deserve it, but have worked tirelessly uh, without sort of that um, reparations that's duly needed in this in, in this moment uh, that this country should be sort of coming to, but has not. Uh, and so it can't just be put on philanthropy alone, that ph philanthropy may need to press in the ways that they can other sectors and other people and other entities to give in ways in which we have not even dreamed of and to open up the purse <laughs> that they have in their coffers, if you will, where they keep this money um, that our people and my ancestors and particularly have built this country on. And so there are uh, queer and trans folks uh, who are in dire strays who do not have the means to have bank accounts nor IDs. And so how in which do we get the money to these people who deserve uh, your funds, if you will, because you, you, we're, you're looking to us to say how we're deserving. And so it, it, we have to beg. And so it, it comes to this moment where how do you move out of the way of that process? How can you humble yourself in the way in which you do the work and utilize your advocacy uh, to, to, to wield your pins, if you will, to come out of the ivory towers and into the streets and say, yes, maybe you hold that position, but it is the time that you should act radically and stop uh, having such judgment on people who, who cannot uh, control their conditions. And so uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a moment in time where we need to pivot and we need to stop saying that we have to follow the rules in which we create and that we can wield the pen to undo these certain rules that, you know, like, like Hacinta said, we have people in bed with the IRS, but y'all scared of the IRS. So, so how do we move that meter? And so I'm, I'm, I'm at a point where I would like to work with people who are, who are being revolutionary, you know, because uh, as Jamala Roberts, uh, Rogers said, there's no algorithm, there's no theory that can predict when human rage reaches its boiling point. And I think that we know that we are at the boiling point. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ash. Um, that's uh, uh, building upon that, and thank you for that inspiration. I think uh, we, we uh, Brenda, we started this conversation about uh, speaking about abolition, um, and I think uh, in that in that uh, context, in that practice, in that journey, um, I think it's also critical to understand uh, that the, the role of the foundations, quite frankly, has been pretty dismal. Because what has happened is, in a sense that that that, they, and I would be very blunt about it, that they have that there's been more support for counter organizing 
towards in our journey towards abolition by funding reformist work, by funding national organization, by funding groups that 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 seem to appease the legislative branch or seem to, or, or want to appease and have these backdoor negotiations with the very people with the very people that are causing intense harm because so instead of really uh, uh, investing in long term because abolition is a multi-generational journey that how do we make policing irrelevant in our lives over time so there is no delete button there is no such thing that you can you can have ordinances and reformists because they murder us transparently they harm us transparently. There, there is no issue of a thing about like, you know, just funding things around trans, more transparency or more accountability and more reporting. Well, <clears throat> LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department as an example has been around since 1869. And if we are still continuing to reform that department, which continues to be the one of the most murderous police departments in the country, then, you know, I mean, we're gonna be, so I think we also have to, and this is where Bob, I'm, I'm not known to hold myself back, but in a sense, like, you know, we have to start looking at it because I think that that also becomes a very white privileged space as well, that while we'll reform the system because we work, want to work within the system. Well, if the system is rotten to the core and, the, the, and I showed an example of the stalker state and if it's a diseased body, then we have to really start looking at it that how do we start looking at dismantling this thing as we are looking at alternatives, as we are looking at collective healing, as we are looking at our health and, and, and fighting back trauma as well. So I think that but the, the, in a sense, just as these uh, briefings and as these breaking down, uh, there's a lot to happen. There's a lot of tools that are being developed. I mean, as Cynthia was talking about, the coalition has been working, developing these zines. In, 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 uh, in fact, our zine, we were approached by a publishing company in Portland who wanted to use the zines the most recently that we produced to send them to jails. And this was done in collaboration with folks like Baby Anarchist and Palestinian Youth Movement and Youth Justice Coalition and various other groups uh, that really looking at it through the eyes of, of, of youth, um, that what do they see? And what is their fight and what is that power? So I think there's a lot of uh, collective knowledge exchange. There's a lot of knowledge decolonization needs to happen. Um, there's a lot of fights that we have in front of us, including the academy as well, because when we started a whole campaign about uh, from uh, academic complicity to academic rebellion, that how are we going after these folks as well who are creating the intellectual frameworks for harm as well. So we are happy to share that knowledge. We are happy to, to work to, to build that together. But I think it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's in some, for the funders to really look at it more deeply and, and try to understand that this is a multi-generational fight. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, we are uh, running a little bit short on time. So we are gonna go on break, on a five minute break uh, for the folks here. Please don't go away and stay because we're gonna move into the Q&A section. So if folks have questions, please add them into the chat. Um, and then we'll have a closing led by Adriana. So um, everyone stay connected and we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you all. It's great that everyone is back with us. Um, so we're gonna move into the Q&A for 10 minutes before we have the closing uh, by the energy folks. So um, are, if there are any questions from folks here, if they are feel comfortable to either um, add them to the chat or if folks actually want to unmute themselves um, and then say them out loud, that will be if that will be great. I have a question. Uh, thank you all. This was such an incredible panel and the report is um, not only powerful, but also so beautifully designed. And I think it's just such a great thing to be able to hear from you directly. And so many of you have been doing this work for so many, many years before funders um, realized that this was important. So thank you for all that, all that groundwork. I guess my question to you all and maybe other funders that are on the call, if they can also answer on the chat is, I was listening to Dr. Ruha Benjamin talk about how what we need to change is not the technologies themselves, but our imagination, no? So I think you all have talked about that already, about how we're talking about systems and not 
necessarily the the things that are easily changed. Um, so for you all, if you can say a little bit more, how, yeah, what part of our imagination do we need to change? And for funders who are um, in, in this call as well, how can we uh, push philanthropy a little bit better to actually fund abolition work? Because honestly, this panel is the first of many, of, of not, there's not that many folks that are talking about um, funding abolition work, no, kind of like so openly. So it's super inspiring. And also I think that as funders, we do have to do some work to make the case for folks that are, aren't feeling it yet. So it's a little bit of a broad question, anywhere you want to take it, but thank you all. I don't know if any of you wants to jump in first. <laughs> I was waiting for Ashton to send to. Ashton, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. It's like the 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 Zoom etiquette of who unmutes first, right? It's the the constant. Um, you know, I I do, I do think I, I remember Ash mentioned this at one point, but an example I always give, I was like, you know, ICE figures out how to have technology to figure out exactly where you are located and like who your cousin is and what your DNA is. But suddenly, when they like separate children at the border, they're like, I don't know where they went, right? Like, there's just like it isn't about the technology, it is about the power structures and the uses of the technology and the power dynamics that are at play. And so to me, the, 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 the issue of the crisis of imagination is both around the uses of technology, but also around these ideas around abolition, right? I mean, I've been in so many spaces where people will say like, talking about abolishing ICE or talking about stopping deportations is not a good policy goal. But meanwhile, like folks have been pushing for comprehensive immigration reform for I don't know how many decades, but that, see, that seemed as like totally reasonable. So I think that the crisis in imagination is really around how we're really thinking about transforming power structures and whether or not we can imagine a world where this is not needed. And I think that that's particularly important as we're talking about the analysis because so many of these technologies are constantly portrayed as like advances towards not having a smaller carceral state while they're really just expanding control in different ways. And so for me, I think it's just a question of continuing to root ourselves and like, yeah, visions of liberation that our people are putting out in terms of how to think of a world without policing um, that can then allow like the imagination for other things to kind of go from there. Um, but I think it's, it's yeah, it, I think it's just a little bit complicated with, with funders too, because there, there's a way in which there's this like a, a level of like, you have to have a little bit proof of proof of concept right before you go. And that has been, I think, part of the thing that has been the most challenging around some of these issues. Um, and so I do think also like the imagination and just kind of the trust of knowing that this is where it's going. Thanks for this important question. I, I, I was trying to wreck my brain around with even saying abolitionism, uh, abolitionist because oftentimes people don't understand that it's not just the getting rid of something, but it's the building. And that is the imagination part that you're asking about. And, and, and oftentimes people are against these things. You know, you think about the turn of the century abolitionists who uh, fought tirelessly for freedom, but that you had to have a vision for that particular freedom. And you had to follow those who were enslaved seeking freedom. You couldn't as someone who was part of the uh, oppressor group envision that freedom for folks. And so oftentimes I see that uh, funders may have a framework, that they're not ready for that, you know, that they themselves don't understand abolitionist work. And that when what they're hearing is, is making them afraid to get rid of a system um, that they're so comfortable in. And so, you know, we have to break free of that comfortability and, and feel uncomfortable with where we, where we need to go and grow. And so, you know, I don't know that they even see themselves as a part of that constellation of people who are seeking and desiring freedom in particular ways that it is only one, that, that there's multiple ways as there are stars in the skies to get to that place. Well, just, uh, um, uh, I think Asinta and Ash has really laid it out really well. And I think I would just echo what, what is being shared that, you know, I mean, just the imagination of, of liberation, imagination of being free from 
from state violence imagination of free from harm imagination of of what our personal and collective health and well-being really looks like uh, but also uh, that also comes with a much deeper understanding and reorienting ourselves as well in a sense that what does that journey really mean what is that that you know it's, it's it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of just repetitive work as well but really truly understanding that the extent of the harm the tools of the harm the the and and that's where how do we work and and, and it's it, it's very much being done for example in our work we've been able to weaponize uh, the public records request in order to understand and not just in through the that legal lens of discovery or anything but even what is the grant application that the los angeles police department is filing for federal funding what is their imagination of this program? How are they looking to unleash this program? What is their staffing going to look like? How, you know, so what is the operational priorities that they have? How it builds into the pre-existing condition or existing programs they have? So I think it's uh, it's it's kind of reorienting ourselves that, you know, that it's a, that what, what sort of an unpacking are we doing, which is really rooted in our own lived experiences of, of, of being on the receiving end of the state violence, but how that collective power over centuries has been built um, and in this in this journey towards dismantling it and abolishing it, so I think that, that, that I would say there's a lot of reorientation needs to happen, and and but that whole collective reorientation would only happen through conversations like this and having more clarity on these things. Yeah, and if I can add, as in my role as a funder as well, I do think that there is that we as funders play such a significant role in like advocating and organizing with other funders. I think when we were working on this report, we specifically remember the moment we had a convening with some folks last year. And I remember actually Hamid telling us that, and some of their folks there, like, if you all are writing a report about technologies, like, you all need to be clear about where are you standing? And this is not about reform, this is about abolition. And that was very clear for us, no, in terms of like what is really our role as funders and also how what is the framework that we're putting on this report and like we're really listening or hoping to really listen to what folks are doing no, on the ground and then how do we bring this back to other spaces like even before we launched this report and even before all of these really inspiring uprisings have been happening this summer here in the US when we brought this conversation to some tech funding spaces folks were kind of confused about us even bringing this up this notion about abolition like tech funders were like i don't know you know what and it felt hard for us and there was that fear about like how do we make the case and i think for me especially for also all of us had a stride also made us think about how we also we also really need to follow how folks are really bold and we also need to be as bold in our funding strategies um, and it's also, and I, I see that as a big role for us and how do we're also creating those spaces for political education around us as funders to really understand and really advocate inside in our internal structures as well. That, and I think that's where the heavy work is, no? Like beyond just the grant making practices is about the politicizing ourselves in our own infrastructures uh, with our boards, with our staff, and then actually how are we practicing that? How are we implementing um, those visions that know that we actually preach and create, how are we actually practicing internally? And it's it's a long-term process, like it's a whole like life project for all of us, like a multi-generation project, as Hamid said. So we we really need to get much better around that. Um, yeah. Um, and I'm also looking at the time, and uh, we might be at time. There's one question uh, that Celia had, but I do know that we want us to transition into the closing by um, Adriana. So we've maybe what we can do is maybe we can share the contact information from folks with everyone who attended this session and then feel free to follow up with them, feel free to learn about their work and their what like, you know, connect with them and also, you know, move money and resources to support their work and stay connected with us. Um, ultimately, that's like the big goal. Now we need to resource uh, these amazing organizers and really all of the organizations that are doing this work. Uh, so thank you everyone so much. And I'm gonna pass this back to Adriana. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda, Ash, Hamid, and Jacinta for helping us imagine moving towards an abolitionist future. I'm Adriana Rocha and just really wanted to appreciate and close out our series. Uh, I wanna express gratitude to all of our speakers, the session organizers, the program community, 
our convening uh, co-chairs and homecoming queens and the participants who made our virtual convening series a possible and a big success. I wanna appreciate our staff team, Elizabeth, Courtney, uh, Shannon, Lauren, uh, Lindsay and Netta and our Girl Friday events team, JC and Shelly, you're a rock stars and just uh, wanted to appreciate your time and your energy. Uh, through two plenaries and six workshops, uh, we've explored uh, many topics, um, black led power building and organizing the role of land and social movements, um, community led solutions to neighborhood violence, participatory grant making models, collaborative leadership of young people of color and accountability and philanthropy's role. And you can view the recordings and resources from all the sessions on NFG's website um, at nfg.org 2020. We'll send that out to all of you. Uh, and please share them out with your colleagues. So if we've been gathering in person in DC where NFG was founded, I uh, would have had uh, the opportunity to celebrate with you all. And I would have been definitely uh, directing folks to our karaoke after party and then the after after party. Um, and I wanna remind you of one of the calls to action from our plenary on people, place, and power. Uh, Mary Hooks, co-director of Southerners on New Ground, issued this call to action for philanthropy. Uh, she said, we have to invest in the policy fights, but also in the new experiments and models. We have to take risks that are worthy of the courage of our people, so that when we're celebrating 80 years at NFG, we're celebrating these wins and the new world that we've built together. So philanthropy has a duty to show up in this monumental moment in the fight ahead. And NFG is here to fight for the new world where Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, queer and transgender communities, rural communities, and workers and unemployed thrive. And we urge you to join us in 2021 and bring your colleagues across and beyond your grant making institutions to do our collective work to organize funders and act as we've been called upon to take risks that are worthy of the courage of our people. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, and we'll cue off with our DJ uh, and final song. Thank you.